Thanks, Kevin, very much indeed. Sun shining here too, really. It's an absolutely glorious day. We've got kids on the outfield playing their games and the groundsman sitting on his heavy roller chugging up and down. It really is absolutely perfect to jog your first cricketing memories, perhaps. And Robert Chadwick, my first test match memories, missing school to go to the England West Indies match on a rainy Monday at Old Trafford in the Four Captains series. So, what was that? That was 1984, uh, wasn't it? Play began around tea time. I was the only spectator in the stand under the old press box. Courtney Walsh on the boundary gave the cagoul schoolboy a quizzical look, like, what are you doing here? England got to 30 for three that evening. Marshall was called for running down the wicket by Nigel Plews in his first test and removed from the attack. By the end of the innings, he had the best figures. Seven for 22. England made 93 and lost by an innings of 156. It was miserable, but I was hooked. There we go. Thank you, uh, Roderick. Lots of more of those. The 88 series, that one. Okay, there we go, of course. So there we are. That's what your memories uh, jogged, as it were, all for a purpose. Because um, we were saying, you know, sport played a very positive role uh, in people's lives, of course, uh, for young people promoting a, a healthy lifestyle and developing team skills. But uh, sport also has a vital role for older people, especially through the work of organisations like the one we're going to talk about at this lunchtime, which is the Sporting Memories Network. It uses reminiscence to help fight conditions like Alzheimer's. And uh, I'm joined by Tony Jameson Allen from uh, that network and Mike Proctor, uh, one of the great supporters of the organisation, is going to be along uh, in a moment to talk about this. So, Tony, let's start with you because this, this is fascinating and, and all these memories uh, and so on. Uh, how, how did this all start? Uh, and it's fantastic to see all these memories come in. Mm. It's, it's brilliant. Um, the Sporting Memories Network has been founded to work particularly with people with dementia and memory problems. Um, traditional activities that are offered tend to be, for older people, tend to be bingo and sing-alongs and, and arts and crafts. And they have a place and people love those and they work really well. But sport isn't traditionally used uh, to trigger memories. and, and to, Reminiscence therapy is, is a, an acknowledged uh, approach to, to improve mental well-being of people living with dementia and memory problems. It also works really well with people who are depressed, who have anxiety and, and those who are becoming socially isolated. Now if your local day centre is only offering arts and crafts and actually you've never really taken part in those things before, you're not really going to start doing them when you're 70, 75. What we've found is that particularly older gentlemen um, really do enjoy uh, gathering together to reminisce about their favourite cricket memories, mm. sporting memories. And it's it's just a great way of um, getting people together in groups to talk about a subject that they're really comfortable talking about. I think particularly fellas tend to, uh, you know, the working lives on a Monday morning, they'll, they'll naturally reminisce about a uh, cricket match they were watching over the weekend or in, indeed memories of what sport they were playing themselves. People living with dementia and memory problems, their short term memories are severely uh, affected yeah. but the long term memory remains intact but it needs a trigger um, and that trigger can be a, an image of a, a cricketing legend like Geoffrey Boycott. Yes, we've got one of those I see a photograph of Geoffrey uh, at Headingley, the famous photograph of his glass of champagne of course and he scored his 100th 100 uh, there it is and magical moments like that yes. can, can take people back in an instant but it doesn't have to be such a huge historic moment like that it could be just a, a simple little, it can be a report, but it can be a sound, it can be a smell, it can be a taste that just instantly takes you back to Absolutely. the earlier years. Yeah. But often, though, I find with the smells and things, I'm not quite sure what it is. <laughs> you, you do smell, I think, oh, wow, why have I, what, what does that remind me of? And not, you're not quite sure. But I suppose if you see a, a photograph of Jeffrey Boycott standing there, something stirs, does it? And, and, that, and, that, and that sort of then makes you really try and search. Is it, is it possible, if you have dementia, to really search your your memory as it were. It's, it's, we all f don't realise just how much we forget naturally. Uh, the brain stores pieces of information in different ways and it discards it and mm. you know we probably wouldn't remember what happened on the in the 15th over of this test match because there was probably nothing significant but we might, I'll certainly remember being stood in the TMS box watching a wicket fall yes. um, but I won't remember anything else around the actual cricket that's taking part. People living with dementia have their, their memories are, are are there, it's just a case of unlocking them. And in 
images are incredibly useful at being able to trigger those but equally conversation is and that's why we ask people to share memories because yes. memories just trigger more and more memories yes and even reading out here's another one who we've got Danny Smith my father Alan Smith took me to Old Trafford in 1971 to see England against India when I was eight years old an odyssey from South Cumbria to Manchester by Vauxhall van rattling train then the first taxi I ever rode in the sky was blue the grass a vivid green and the Indians were brilliant the spell was cast thanks dad funny how I remember not just the cricket but all the rest of them but the fact that he just went to the taxi for the first time yeah and the, and the conversations there's a group of guys have been meeting for over two years in uh, a library in Haddington in East Lothian and um, for the first half of their session they'll they'll reminisce about um, a favourite sport or they'll focus on one of the guys whole sporting memories and those conversations they might start off on sport but they naturally migrate to the pubs that people drank in before matches mm. how they got to the game um, I mean imagine being able to remember your first taxi ride <laughs> it's extraordinary isn't it it, it is amazing so, so I mean how do this sort of sporting memories work as opposed to treatments and so on it also works side by side alongside treatment essentially it's a talking therapy um, the, there's, there's a lot of evidence that there's a huge risk around people becoming socially isolated now loneliness is, is a big risk to our physical and mental health um, older people um, there's about 5 million people in the UK who are identified as being socially isolated now and the chief medical officer likened loneliness to the equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day in terms of the damage to your health mm -hmm. so we need to be creative in, in how we can offer different activities for people to join in and for instance today uh, at Bristol Road Pavilion at Gloucester County Cricket Club uh, there'll be a group of gentlemen there reminiscing about um, Gloucestershire cricket uh, a legend that's sat next to me yes. <laughs> in the in the score box now and it, it gives an opportunity for guys to, to create groups friends, new fr they meet new friends who have one thing in common it's not about a medical diagnosis it's not about having dementia or depression the thing in common is a love of sport yes. can you give some examples as to how it's worked. I mean, it must have. The, the, the most remarkable um, case study is, is a gentleman called Bill Corbett who was attending a day centre um, and very little was known about Bill. Um, he was living with dementia and often when you do reminiscence sessions they don't get recorded or written down. Um, you just do a session about what you're doing in your childhood and then next week let's talk about work and the following week we'll talk about holidays and none of this gets recorded. The difference with Bill was um, they knew he'd played a bit of sport but that was about it. Through the sessions looking at, at images of Scottish football, not only could he name every player in the photos, but he had played against them. Uh, a little bit of research was done after each session, and to cut a, a, a long story short, as a 20-year-old Bill had played for Scotland uh, really? at, at Wembley. Uh, it was during the war, so caps weren't awarded, so there was no record online of Bill Corbett ever having played. Uh, it was in 48, um, and he played in front of 75,000 spectators at Wembley against the cream of English football uh, which included Tommy Lawton, Stanley Matthews and Dennis Compton. <laughs> Um, he had no memory of it himself. His memory was triggered through these images. Right, Otherwise, so it did start to come. It came out, the whole story emerged, and um, the, the, the end of that story was uh, Bill was given a copy of the programme, uh, he was given uh, images of, of himself in the lineup, and uh, the match reports actually said that he, he put up the finest display uh, against Tommy Lawton. He marched, marked him out of the match, it finished nil nil uh, and Bill's partners in defence that day uh, on one side of him was Matt Busby and the other side was Bill Shankly <laughs> extraordinary now not everyone has a story like Bill to tell no, no. but everyone has a story yeah. and that's what we try to uncover to, to, to get people's um, feelings of, of, of themselves back um, that might get lost from, from living with memory problems absolutely David Selman here we go I'm just sort of throwing in these examples as we go, really, we'll speak to Procky in a minute. Uh, my early 
earliest memory of watching cricket was in the early summer of 1948. I was six years old. I was to be seven in September 1948. I was taken to hospital in Rotherham for an eye operation, squint correction, and was blindfolded for a few weeks after the operation. This procedure was in its infancy in 1948, I'll bet, and my stay in hospital was seven weeks. When I was discharged, Mr. Green, a friend and neighbour of my parents, asked them if he could take me to Bramall Lane to see the all-conquering Australian touring team. Mr. Green was a Yorkshire member, wanted to get me interested in the game as a special treat also after my operations. My parents agreed, but by bus and by tram from Rotherham to Bramall Lane, Sheffield, I recall going up onto a very old balcony to watch the game. Mr. Green pointed who was who, and eventually Don Bradman came into bat. He explained to me who Don Bradman was, but at the time it didn't mean a lot. However, as I got older, I recognised the importance of who and what I had seen. I also remember having sandwiches and cake during the day. It was a luxury in 1948, of course, with the rationing. So there we go. Nice again. It's again, there's funny little details that get thrown in, and it's, it, it just it sparks off. I mean, okay, Don Bradman on the one hand, but then sandwiches and cake yeah. because of the lifestyle at the time and the rationing yeah. and everything else. Yeah, it's a marvellous memory, and, and I have to mention uh, my father passed away nine years ago, but uh, he was born in Scarborough and he worked in the score box. Oh. Um, and he was at the uh, Bradman's final innings in England uh, in '48. So that that's a wonderful yeah, memory. Chips in. Mike Proctor, lovely to see you. How on earth did you get involved in this uh, very very worthy cause indeed well it's fantastic isn't it some of those stories are absolutely yeah. amazing you know I, I was uh, Tony got hold of me and uh, we had a chat and I wanted to help very much if I could sort of uh, help with the dementia guys and trick some memories mm. um, do you feel good about that why, why did you choose Procky um, Gloucester County Cricket Club have been absolutely fantastic they hosted uh, groups but they also work with us on memories matches where we raise awareness about conditions like dementia uh, and at the games it's, we've got a T20 next Friday as part of the Cheltenham Cricket Festival um, against Surrey where we're working with the club and, and Procky's coming as, as guest of honour and we, we interview fans but it also gives us a chance through the matchday programme or, and through media to raise awareness of dementia um, so it's twofold we, we gather the memories of the fans on the day yes. uh, and we'll have school kids interviewing uh, supporters all all through the match um, and then we use those memories in the groups um, and Gloucestershire were, were the first um, club to really embrace the whole concept and have been fantastic to work with. And with Procky, uh, I guess I'm thinking of, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing totally, so I'm talking nonsense tell me, but I mean I'm guessing that, that people who watched Mike in the 70s are now well possibly you know, very much of that age where dementia and Alzheimer's could be a could be an yeah. issue in their lives. Yeah, yeah. This fellow is, is unforgettable, he's, he's, he's tear away bowling action and stumps exploding big hitting and everything else it, it, is that why again you went for went for Mike yeah I mean you know they named the county after him <laughs> he's such a legend that that he he will trigger so many memories and, and you're quite right that in terms of the demographic and age group of, of supporters those who were watching him play probably are in that age group now where they, they will really benefit from reminiscing about his, his fantastic displays for the county got one here Mike that does relate to you actually from Mark Holmes I was, back in 82-83 I was drafted into a club team as they were one short it was a benefit game for one of his Gloucestershire teammates as can be predicted I ended up walking to the wicket to face Mr Proctor two leg please ump I stuttered and took guard Procky being a gentleman came in off a half run and sent one down outside off stump which I missed the slips were smirking and giggling away as apparently I was still on my back lift as the keeper was tossing the ball to first slip. Not deterred, I prepared to face ball number two and had premeditated just stepping across my stumps and taking pot luck as I felt sure he wouldn't try and bounce me. As luck would have it, I got a very thick edge which went for four through third man. Mr Proctor gave me a small sideways glance and stormed in again. No prizes for getting the outcome. The castle came tumbling down and I firmly believe the keeper is still spitting
putting out the splinters. But after the game, this is where this is definitely Proppy, we all assembled in the bar, and Proppy had the good grace to come over and ask how hard enjoyed it. Total gentleman, I spent lots of time chatting and reminiscing. So there we go. You wouldn't remember that, I don't suppose, Proppy, but there you are. Yeah, fantastic. No, I, I don't quite remember it. But, uh... <laughs> I'm not entirely surprised. You didn't remember. Someone actually sent me a, a message just now taking you back to Swansea in a county game, clearly uh, Gloucestershire against Glamorgan, I guess, where you batted for 40 minutes at the close of play. You have about 50 odd odd out and hit three sixes into the sea. And he didn't remember that. Well, I don't know about the sea. It's quite a big hit. It is a quite a big hit, yeah. That might have been exaggerated over the years. But I remember getting a few runs uh, in, at Swansea. Pretty short boundary straight. Yes. And if. Uh, the sea just beyond. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. So. Um, just a, a last bit on, on this, then I'm going to talk to Procky about what he's up to these days. So this, this particular event that you're happening and, and, and hoping that, that Procky will stir some, some yeah, memories. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it follows on, we worked with the MCC uh, yeah. on their 200th uh, anniversary game, where we did similar, we, we had um, skilled kids interviewing fans. We did a, a different version of Spot the Ball. Uh, we did with, with cricket, with Mike Gatting um, playing against the, uh, the Australians. And and again, we just ask fans to share those memories, and, and that's what Friday is all about. Is we're going to celebrate the history and the heritage of the club, yep. but we're going to also raise awareness of dementia and use all of those memories uh, to to use in the groups across the country. Yeah, and how can people get involved in that? Then they're going to see you at the ground. They can either see us at the ground, or they can submit memories on the website. There's there's hundreds there to read. Um, just just come to Sporting Memories and, and choose your favourite sport. We've got Formula One, we've got football, we've got cricket, tennis, right. we're working with the Commonwealth Games to get athletics memories so they don't have to be good about cricket but we do like cricket memories yeah. Tour de France, do I think you were involved in last week Yeah, we were, we were at 12 at the Spectator Hub so I don't think we've slept for the last 6 <laughs> days <laughs> <laughs> Well, what a great what a great thing, so that's uh, sportingmemories.com sportingmemoriesnetwork.com There we go, lovely Well, thanks so much for coming and telling us all about that uh, I'm going to talk to Procky a bit now as well because it's great to see you Mike Great, great to be back in England, did, 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 did you come back this way very often or not? Uh, to England, yeah. I, I've been coming over, I stopped playing at 80, 82 I think it was, and uh, I've been playing in a well-being charity match that the late um, uh, Sir, Sir Victor Blanks had Sir Victor oh, Blanks yes. David Frost, the late Sir David Frost. Um, he started it, started it with Sir Victor Blank. Mm -hmm. uh, they've been going 25 years now and raised a lot of money for well-being. Right. So, um, you were playing, did you? Well, I, play, I didn't play this, this year. Right. I, 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 I officially retired. Not officially retired. I've just had a bit of a, another operation on another knee, so oh. uh, wasn't wasn't fit. But I, I did some umpiring. But the first time I haven't played for the, twenty odd years. Yeah. There's so much affection for you in, in this country. I mean, do, you, I mean, do you really feel that whenever you do, do come back, especially going down there to, to Gloucestershire? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I lived. Um, it seems I lived half my life here, and uh, I really enjoyed it. I sort of embraced Gloucestershire. Um, I think the fans there embraced the team. I think you know we had. A, what I think was a, was a fabulous team because we had wonderful team spirit and, and I think the fans enjoyed the way we played and but they really were fantastic you know you, you that game you were talking about 77 um, you guys were talking about earlier in, in the program uh, it was the fans that really got me going you know because at that stage 77 I, I suppose I was probably about a yard and a half from my quickest with off my knee operations and that but you know I just sensed that was uh, we had batted poorly on a flat docile Southampton pitched fast outfield. The weather had been great for a couple of couple of weeks, and the outfield was very quick. And um, you know, it wasn't a swing day. And the peculiar thing about that was bowling to, to Greenwich and Richards. Well, my goodness me, that's a challenge at the best of times. But over the wicket, the ball didn't swing too much. It sort of drifted in, but that was mainly because of my arm, arm action. I thought, well, after I bowled a couple of overs, I thought, and I've got to start try something different. These guys are looking pretty good, and for an unknown reason. Um, the ball swung more around the wicket and you know I kept the ball full and uh, the guys got their pads in the way a couple of times and you know I just got lucky it's dramatic that was stuff wasn't it I was just watching it again then it, it, it brought memories back for me I must say I remember watching that game it's fantastic yeah because we tearing in <laughs> yeah I mean we, we we were about 100 for one at lunch I think and then we ended up scoring about 200 maybe a bit less which was a, a ne never a, yeah. never a pass score and they were sort of cruising at I think it was 19 for naught. I think that was the score I think what then, you'd have done I mean, we were talking about this earlier but 
what you would have done with the reverse swing, the way that you bowled, tearing in round the wicket. I mean, we didn't know what reverse swing was in those days, do we? Really? Occasionally, the ball might have done a bit of a strange thing, but you'd have been devastating today in, in, in conditions where the ball was a bit scuffed and dry and swinging it the other way at that sort of a speed, don't you think? Well, I don't know whether I could swing it the other way, I guess, to be fair. I mean, that reverse swing, I'm still a bit confused by it, to be yeah. honest, but uh, you know, to think if that's possible, what you're saying, yeah, that, that would, would have put back life difficult for the best, for yeah. sure. But it's imagine that action, the length that you bowled and from round the wicket, helter skelter. Were, were you one of those cricketers who um, was just not coached, really? I mean, the bowling action is unusual. It must have been just a totally natural thing for you. I mean, did people try and stop you bowling like that? No. And what you, <laughs> it just confirms what you're saying. I think it was such a bad action that the coaches it wanted to be. And it's unusual. Uh, unusual. But, yeah. I mean, they saw me bowl and they just thought, well, it's impossible to coach this because when I was at the junior school, I, I was mainly a batsman, kept wicket a bit, bowled a bit of off spin. And then when I went to high school, I was still very small, uh, age 13, 14, only mature, and sort of 16, 17, grew a bit bigger. And I bowled in the nets a bit of seam. And then the first team we didn't have an opening bowler, so I just sort of medium pace and as I sort of filled out um, I had this peculiar action uh, which no one ever ever said one word to me about. Did they really? They no. just le left you completely? I, I think that was because I, I was doing other things you know I batted and got in mainly as a batsman and, uh, a, a, a wicket keeper um, and then when it came to you know 16 or 17 um, my action was already there so I, I think the coaches just had one look and said well you know how can we possibly change that? Yeah. It must have been very hard for a new batsman to pick up I mean it's like I don't know, Lassith Malinga, for instance, for that was a very unusual slingy action. When you first come out, I mean, did you get a lot of people out to your first ball when they first come out and, whoa, well, bang, it's all over? Yeah, you know, that was very much on my mind. It was very, very much so. I mean, uh, the tactics were very important. But if I hadn't bowled to a guy, um, I concentrated very, very hard and trying to get the ball to swing and bowl right in the block off. The first ball. Bowl him out. Yeah, absolutely. That, uh, I really, you know, that was sort of uh, really number one, one for me to a new guy. If I could do that, I'd uh, achieve so because he hadn't seen me. And the first time I saw my action was on Movie Tone News in 1966, 67. We'd been playing against Australia. No television. I mean, South Africa didn't get television until the mid 70s. And we as a team went to watch the, the news in a movie, which was also very unusual. But um, there I was bowling. I actually couldn't believe it. I really couldn't. You thought so you were Dennis Lilly, did you? Oh, yeah, that? absolutely. I had a perfect action. <laughs> <laughs> and I said to the other guys, they could they couldn't believe it because my eyes nearly popped out of my head. Yeah. Story, the story. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's actually brilliant. And you've always, I mean, you know, hostile, fast bowler, etc., etc. But you've you've always been a social cricketer too, haven't you? I mean, you have always enjoyed that, that, that social side of being a, a cricketer. Yeah, I, I just love playing cricket. You know, I really did. And I, I just felt um, I've never an averages guy, and I always felt that whatever I could contribute to the team winning, that was the ultimate. You know, if you did well individually and scored runs and took wickets, but the team didn't win. It didn't feel so good. Yeah, yeah. What are you up to now then? Because you have a foundation in, in Durban, don't you? That you yeah, know. yeah. And, and Gloucestershire, as Tony's saying, Gloucestershire has been fantastic. You know, I um, wrote to them about the foundation and uh, they made an awareness day uh, last Friday for, for me at, at the county ground and gave a little talk uh, to the spectators there. And, um, you know, they, they've embraced it. And it really started the foundation because the, three or four years ago, four years ago, in fact, um, I was coaching and being sponsored to coach uh, at, a, at a black school, African school, outside, outside Durban in Berlin. And it's a school which uh, is very, very poor. There's about 900 kids. Um, the average... 900 kids in one school? 900. Oh, wow. it's, it's fantastic. Uh, I mean, I've got a little video that they clipped in which, which I'll show to promote the foundation. And, um, you know, it started off 900 kids, never seen cricket in their lives before, nothing. And it's grown and grown. Uh, the sponsor fell away. Um, so I've been funding it for the last two and a half years. We raised a little bit of money here and there, but not a lot. Um, and it came to a bit of a hit at the beginning of this year because Ms. Masani, the principal, and uh, Rodney Malamba, a, a friend of mine, African friend of mine, who can speak the lingo a lot better than I can. So that's why I got him involved because the junior school. And so the kids aren't, uh, aren't too okay with 
with English. And uh, we were sitting with the, with the teachers and, and Mr. Son, the principal, we went through what the coaching can be done because you've got to coach during school hours because after hours, it's a little bit mayhem because 90 of the kids are H HIV positive, uh, which means you know, there are not too many mothers and fathers around, grandpas, grannies, uncles and aunts. Um, so it's got to what be done. extraordinary environment. No, no, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. But the kids, they, you can't believe it. I mean, you can see on my little video there, they're as happy, they've got nothing, absolutely nothing. Uh, and it really is amazing. And, and do, do, they, do they live at the school or are they sort of adopted elsewhere? How are these orphaned kids with well, HIV looked after? Well, they just live in the hills and shacks and uh, it's just incredible. And, and to me, cricket was cricket was a vehicle to use to better their lives. And they, they just love it. I mean, they, they're smiling faces. They, they, you show them how to hold a bat and someone to throw a ball. And it's like they're the center of attention. You know, for suddenly these guys are center of attention. And the girls as well, they're fantastic. They really do. We had, we had a little girl, um, and Rodney mentioned it on the little video I've got. She says, there's a lady across there playing. We showed her how to hold, pick up the bat, hold the bat. She's eight years old. Never, she might have seen it the year before when we'd been coaching, but never got her favorite cricket at all. She held the bat reasonably like she'd hold a cricket bat. And the little guy the other end, it's his turn to bowl, so he runs up and throws. As luck would happen, it was sort of a straightish and a low full P. She played a cover drive for, for, for four. I mean, I looked at Rodney. And, I mean, it wasn't a straight, straight bat, but it was like He's good half cross bat and then bang on the offside. And it's like goosebumps and stuff. You know, Rodney and I looked at each other and we just went, wow, that's just got international written all over it, you know? And those kind of things, uh, you know, are really rewarding. And I, I just want to see those kids grow and grow. And, and when I see the came to, I'm not talking too much, but when I see the game to fruition at the beginning of the year, it was Ms. Masani said to me, um, so we've got a bit of a problem because some of the, the, the parents or grandparents or uncles and aunts are moaning because why does this little Johnny go to cricket lessons and this little Johnny doesn't? So I said, well, between Rodney and I, we sort of tried to get who we think could be able to play or not. So it's a bit unfair from that point of view. We were just coaching about 45 kids between the two of us, you know, weekly. And she said, well, how are we going to solve it? So I said, well, I think Rodney and I'll have to do it. She said, right, up to you and Rodney to solve it. So I said to Rodney, I said, Rodney, what are we going to do? I said, you know my belief, I know your belief. We've got to see every single kid. And we started off by going to each class by having two hits, by having two throws or bowls, and then we decided, no, they've got to play in the game environment. So now we just take one class, 60 kids, and we have two or three games, and sort of try and coach them in between the games. And <coughs> Excuse me. And th th that's the only way. So what, what we intend to do, I had two nets put in the school, because the facilities are absolutely non-existent. I, mean, I was going to ask about that. I mean, yeah, it's all very well trying to coach cricket, but if it's doing it in a... Well, on, on a paddock or just with no you know, rough land. But this is when when, I, when we started off and we were coaching the, in the classroom and that's round, that's cricket field and that, there's, there's the pitch and those are called stumps and going through all this and how you hold a bat and I said, Rodney, we've got to try and play games. We can't just be, you know, it's too, we've got to get game situation going. So we've got to know where to play. He said, why not here? I said, where? And you just mentioned, what did you talk about? A cow patch or a paddock patch? And it's, I mean, it's very uneven. I said, but uh, Rodney said, well, that's our house. I said, okay, let's do it. So he put up some stumps and one ball went two meters that way and one yeah. went two meters that way and eventually one was hit and then it was Kajima, which is run in Zulu. And it's, it's, it's just created such a good vibe within the school. You know, it's, uh, it's amazing. So we, we, we are looking to, to get a lot of try and get money for the foundation to, to get a lot of coaching. In. I want to get, you know, to, to coach. And Rodney's just emailed me the other day and said they've now lost us four times a week and plus a Saturday afternoon. So it's just grown, it's yeah. grown far too big. I mean, out of the 900 kids um, who wanted to play, we found out how many wanted to play. It amounted to 846, I think. So, you know, it was just absolutely impossible. Yeah. But the kids love it. I mean, they really do. You can see by the video. It's, it's just so rewarding. But, you know, people out there really want to help. And we had that same meeting on a Friday uh, in January before the term started. It had been going a week because Ms. Bassani said to me, Mike, we've got another little problem. And this is why the foundation, I think, is great. Because um, I was just in the, uh, in the embryo stage with the foundation then. And she said um, on a Friday, she said, we promised the kids uh, food for next week because we are, we are um, a Pernell, Pernell 5 school, which 
which is that's the allocation by the government. They don't get fed January and December. So she said, well, um, you know, can we can, can you help us with some food for the kids? I said for all the week. She said, yeah. So my head was doing a little bit. Nine hundred. Nine hundred plus twenty or thirty school teachers. And I said, what do you want? And uh, there were a few other teachers were there. And they wrote down 15 items, which were huge supplies. You can imagine. Yes. Yeah. And I mean, it wasn't it wasn't me because I made I made it wasn't just me. I mean, I was the instigator, sure, but all the other people helped. They don't get any credit for it. But by Tuesday lunchtime, she had everything she wanted for the whole school. And it was you know, that to me was you know incredible. It had no cost to anybody. You know, it was, but you're so animated about this. You can just tell her when you're just absolutely bursting with this, aren't you? Yeah. Well, it's just, it's it, it happened. Funny enough, you say that, but Rodney, we'd finished a coaching session. And Rodney doesn't know about the finances. No, he knows nothing. I just, I've always paid him whatever it is, which that's by the by. And we're driving away after one good, good little school session, and, and Rodney said, you know, Proc, he said, if we ever stop this, we'll make all these kids very, very sad. And I said, Rodney, we here for life, my friend. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Is, is there a vast, un, there must be vast, untapped res, reserve of resources for South African cricket out there? It's, it's just, well, your school is an example. It, it just hasn't, cricket hasn't got there yet. Yeah, it, it is. Yeah, it hasn't got there yet. But, you know, I didn't do it purely for the cricket because I, I'm a great believer. If we can if we can do it in one school, if we can get that school right, and it, it's an education for the kids. They have a better life. They understand how we want to life to be lived and if we can do it in one school we can do it in two schools two becomes four four becomes eight and in 20 25 years time if we can educate all these youngsters in all the schools in south africa which is an impossible dream i know we're going to have a better society by yeah. far yeah. You know? so that's that's my sort of big dream obviously to, to get some cricketers but just to better their lives and see those happy faces yeah. is great philip mall is a nice uh, memory to finish on my earliest memory of watching international cricket live was the rest of the world against England at the Oval in August 1970. The series replaced, of course, the cancelled tour of the South Africans. Remember it well. And your guest today inflicted a pair on Brian Luckhurst. Brian Luckhurst, which were his only wickets in the match. Correct. I was 12 at the time. The teams are packed with the stars of the day. It cost 10 shillings to get in. It's that 50p, wasn't it? Mr. Proctor was a wonderful sight in full flight when bowling, a powerful hitter in the middle order. He scored. In that game? In the first innings. What are you? You're 50. Oh, sorry. You're 51. Oh, okay. The following July is at Lords when John Snow and Sonny Gavaskar collided. Having tossed Mr. Gavaskar's bat back at him, John Snow was dropped for the next test. We sat on the grass that day. Great memories. Yeah, Philip. And uh, Bob Whedon, in the early 50s, I used to go with my dad to our local league club, Crew LMR, who played in the North Staffs and South Cheshire League. I saw some top pros, including Vinu Mankad. Admission was three three D, three pence. I wasn't trying to work out that was. I went with my school on a trip to the Ashes Test at Old Trafford, in which Jim Laker took 19 wickets because I'd only ever watched league cricket. I had no idea of the second innings. So after Laker finished off the Aussies, I went back on the bus, assuming the game was over. I sat there for several minutes before realising that I was alone, that the sounds of play had resumed. I was afraid that a steward let me back in, and I continued watching. It was all explained to me when I got home. Many years later, I'm still involved with the game, being volunteer groundsman at my local club, Greenfield, in the Saddleworth League. So, there we are. Fantastic, Mike. Lovely to have you with us Thanks, Agus. Great. It really is. I could talk to you all day. Good luck with your school. What's the name of the foundation? Mike Proctor Foundation. Couldn't be easier. Thank you. Thanks Thank for you. coming. You've got some tea here. What's all all about? Uh, I've brought a lemon and ginger cake. Have you? Baked by my sister-in-law, Wendy Bruton. Oh, sorry, Wendy Bruton. Yep. Uh, up in Harrogate. Um, and my brother Chris Jameson has sent you some Yorkshire tea to enjoy. Oh, that is fantastic. From the there, there was no need for this, obviously. <laughs> Thank you, Tony, for, for this. It's extraordinary. Uh, and uh, that will have enlightened an awful lot of people and on a number of ways, that lunch discussion. Thank you. Good luck. That was wonderful. Uh, on Thank Friday. You. Okay, thanks, Tony. Thanks to Procky. Good stuff. Thanks. We'll go and have some lunch and great to catch up with the old boy again. Uh, meanwhile, out in the middle, of course, uh, we've got some play to resume.